in every corner of the globe and located in any of the seven oceans of our world, you will find representatives from the United States Navy. Recurrent in the history of the United States Navy are attempts to dismantle and discard the wrongly maligned seagoing force from the disbandment of the Navy after the American Revolution to efforts after World War II when a few short-sighted individuals thought that armed conflict could be resolved by an airplane or a single bomb alone. In the last two centuries, the United States Navy has more than proven its worth and secured its place among our armed forces. And its place is everywhere and anywhere. As President Bill Clinton once said, The word of crisis breaks out in Washington. It's no accident that the first question that comes to everyone's lips is, where is your dearest parent? Using the most advanced technology and maintaining a presence as a first responder to natural disasters and a first line of defense should any nation seek to attack the United States or any of her allies is the mission of the United States Navy. Join us in our continued look at the history, battles, and the men and women of the United States Navy. A good navy is not a provocation to war. It is a sure guarantee of peace. Notice, travelers intending to embark on the Atlantic voyage are reminded that a state of war exists between Germany and her allies and Great Britain and her allies. That the zone of war includes the waters adjacent to the British Isles. That, in accordance with formal notice given by the Imperial German government, Vessels flying the flag of Great Britain or any of her allies are liable to destruction in those waters and that travelers sailing in the war zone on the ships of Great Britain or her allies do so at their own risk. Imperial German Embassy, Washington, D.C., 22nd April, 1915. In April of 1915, German submarine forces, known to most of the world as U-boats, had begun in earnest a trade blockade of the United Kingdom and other allies in Europe. This essentially meant that German submarine crews assumed that any ships passing through or near the area of blockade would be a threat, either directly as warships or indirectly through secretly stowing military ordnance or other supplies. The ocean liner RMS Lusitania had operated for the Cunard Line since 1907. At the outbreak of World War I, she took precautions to avoid enemy ships, such as painting the hull a slate gray, but still operated as a passenger liner. By the time of German exclusion, Lusitania had returned to civilian colors and was no longer as cautious as she had been at the outbreak of the hostilities. Indeed, the Lusitania's patronage had dwindled somewhat, and in spite of warnings placed in New York newspapers by the German embassy in the weeks before launch, on May 1st, 1915, with nearly 2,000 passengers and crew, the ocean liner set sail from New York City en route to Liverpool, the ship's home port. Seven days later, the ship was identified and shot by torpedoes from the German U-boat U-20. The liner sank in 20 minutes, 11 miles off the old head of Kinsale, Ireland. The Lusitania was not equipped with enough lifeboats for the scrambling passengers and crew, and the attack killed 1,198 people, including many American citizens. The attack would prove instrumental in the decision at long last for the United States of America to enter into World War I. In 1913, President Woodrow Wilson assigned future president Franklin Delano Roosevelt 
to serve as Assistant Secretary of the Navy under Secretary of the Navy Josephus Daniels. Daniels himself was an ardent supporter of the Navy, and measures taken by Daniels, such as barring liquor from Navy ships and forbidding prostitution within five miles of any Navy installation, served to create a strong and efficient fighting force. Roosevelt backed these measures wholeheartedly and was just as adamant in his negotiations with Congress and other government departments when it came to budgets and with shipbuilders and other contractors that sought to undermine Union shipbuilders. During FDR's time as Assistant Secretary, not a single shipbuilder strike occurred. Roosevelt's measures helped expand the Navy exponentially, including the founding and development of the United States Navy Reserve, as well as acting as an early proponent of submarine warfare to combat the German U-boat fleet. Shortly before the sinking of the Lusitania, when it had become clear that Germany was engaged in all-out submarine war, Roosevelt urged President Wilson to allow the Navy to outfit for war. Wilson refused. By the following year, the United States Navy had been mobilized into action on the seas surrounding the United Kingdom. As World War I drew to a close, Roosevelt oversaw the demobilization effort, but outright opposed the emerging ideas about dismantling the Navy altogether. Roosevelt later said, Our security is not a matter of weapons alone. The arm that wields them must be strong. The eye that guides them clear. The will that directs them indomitable. Germany's fleet of U-boats numbered only 29. However, in the beginning 10 weeks of World War I, the submarine force had sunk or disabled five British cruisers. The Germans practiced unrestricted warfare, meaning that their torpedoes fired indiscriminately at merchant and passenger ships, as well as military vessels. President Wilson repeatedly warned and scolded the Germans, who ignored the President's threat of United States entry into the war. Finally, on November 17, 1917, the United States Navy destroyers, the U.S. Fanning and the USS Nicholson, became involved in the first victory over the U-boats. The German sub U-58 moved to attack the British merchant ship SS Welshman when the Fanning and Nicholson dropped depth charges and opened fire on the U-boat when she surfaced. The battle ended in German surrender. It would be the first of only a handful of victories over the nigh unstoppable enemy subs in World War I. After the Continental Navy was disbanded in 1790, the United States Revenue Cutter Service was formed. For the eight years that the United States operated without a Navy, the Cutters were the only seagoing armed force in operation. Founded by then Treasury Secretary Alexander Hamilton, revenue cutters saw action in the quasi-war with France, as well as in the War of 1812, alongside the recently formed United States Navy. In 1848, a combination of state and local humanitarian efforts led to the formation of the United States Life Saving Service. Its mission was the search and rescue of shipwrecked merchant seamen and passengers, aiding in natural disasters such as the Great Carolina Hurricane of 1854. In 1915, these two services officially merged to form the United States Coast Guard. It was from the Life Saving Service's 1899 Regulation Manual that the Coast Guard's unofficial motto came, you have to go out 
but you don't have to come back. The manual outlined the never give up, never say die attitude that must be the way of life for all who serve in the Coast Guard. In attempting a rescue, the keeper will select either the boat, breeches buoy, or life car, as in his judgment is best suited to effectively cope with the existing conditions. If the device first selected fails after such trial as satisfies him that no further attempt with it is feasible, he will resort to one of the others, and if that fails, then to the remaining one, and he will not desist from his efforts until by actual trial the impossibility of effecting a rescue is demonstrated. The statement of the keeper that he did not try to use the boat because the sea or surf was too heavy will not be accepted unless attempts to launch it were actually made and failed, or unless the confirmation of the coast as bluffs, precipitous banks, etc. is such as to unquestionably preclude the use of a boat. The Coast Guard began to prepare for World War I prior to the official U.S. declaration of war on April 6, 1917. The year prior was spent updating telephone and telegraph communications and improving upon lighthouses and aid and rescue stations. After the official declaration came, the Coast Guard was placed under the operational control of the U.S. Navy with the Coast Guard's 4,000 officers and men and 44 vessels working in tandem with the Navy in search and rescue, as well as combat operations during the Great War. During the War of 1812, the United States Navy suffered from an enormous lack of enlisted men. As such, they placed no restriction on the enlistment of black men during that time, and it soon came to be that 25% of the squadrons fighting at the Battle of Lake Erie were African Americans. During the Mexican War, African American men served on the USS Treasury and the USS Columbus, and during the Civil War, more than 100,000 of these former slaves served as part of the Union Navy. However, the employment of black men in the Navy was abruptly curtailed after 1900. Paralleling the rise of Jim Crow and legalized segregation in much of America was the cutback in the number of black sailors who by 1909 were mostly in the galley and the engine room. It is hereby declared to be the policy of the president that there shall be equality of treatment and opportunity for all persons in the armed services without regard to race, color, religion, or national origin. On July 26, 1948, President Harry S. Truman issued Executive Order 9981, abolishing segregation in the military. The United States Navy had a varying history with enlisted black men, dating back to the War of 1812 and the Spanish-American War, where the fleets were made up of anywhere from 20 to 40 percent African Americans, to World War I, where black men were almost excluded from enlistment altogether. Serving in only such roles as mess duty and coal passing, they made up only around 1 percent of the Navy's enlistment. After the Great War, from 1922 through 1932, Policy prohibited African Americans from enlisting at all. With Truman's order, segregated fleets and units were to be a thing of the past, although the last all-black units saw combat in Korea in 1950. After the attack on Pearl Harbor during World War II, Dory Miller became the first African American to be honored with the Navy Cross for his actions during the attack. A cook, third class, Miller operated a machine gun on the deck of the USS West Virginia. Miller had no training on the weapon, but held off enemy fire and is credited with shooting down at least one Japanese fighter plane. For distinguished devotion to duty, 
extraordinary courage, and disregard for his own personal safety during the attack on the fleet in Pearl Harbor, territory of Hawaii, by Japanese forces on December 7, 1941. While at the side of his captain on the bridge, Miller, despite enemy strafing and bombing, and in the face of a serious fire, assisted in moving his captain, who had been mortally wounded, to a place of greater safety, and later manned and operated a machine gun directed at enemy Japanese attacking aircraft until ordered to leave the bridge. Should hostilities once break out between Japan and the United States, it would not be enough that we take Guam and the Philippines, nor even Hawaii and San Francisco. To make victory certain, we would have to march into Washington, D.C. and dictate the terms of peace in the White House. I wonder if our politicians, who speak so lightly of a Japanese-American war, have confidence as to the final outcome and are prepared to make the necessary sacrifices. Five hours on December 7th, 1941, the Japanese sank or severely damaged eight battleships, 10 smaller warships, and over 200 American aircraft. 24,000 U.S. soldiers and sailors lost their lives in what was essentially a surprise attack. There was no formal declaration of war, but sure enough, the attack itself, one of the worst defeats in U.S. naval history, brought the United States Armed Forces into World War II. Ten days after the Pearl Harbor attacks, the U.S. Pacific Fleet received a new Commander-in-Chief, Admiral Chester Nimitz. His swearing-in ceremony was on the deck of the submarine USS Grayling. Protocol dictated that this ceremony take place on board a battleship. However, all available battleships stationed at Pearl Harbor had been sunk or badly damaged. Nimitz, who had commanded battleships, cruisers, and destroyers between the wars, and served on destroyers in World War I, was quick to mobilize Navy forces in an effort to drive the Japanese from their recently occupied territories in the Pacific. In spite of the devastating loss of vessels, supplies, and manpower, Nimitz was able to use all available forces to halt the Japanese advance in the Pacific. As more men and warships became available, the fleet commander went on the offensive with successful naval campaigns, such as the Battle of the Coral Sea and the Solomon Islands campaign, including the Battle of Midway. He led successful amphibious attacks on Japanese stations in Iwo Jima and Okinawa. The latter operation was later called the last great battle of the war. The ferocity of the combat actions left 12,000 Americans dead, but the Japanese lost over 100,000. It was this battle that cemented the Navy's decision not to invade the Japanese mainland, and instead suggest the use of the atomic bomb to incur Japan's surrender. When the Japanese officially surrendered on September 2nd, 1945, Admiral Chester Nimitz signed the instrument of surrender as the official representative of the United States. President Franklin Roosevelt needed a senior military officer to advise him as the U.S. entered World War II. His choice was Fleet Admiral William Leahy. In the Navy since 1897, Leahy served in the Spanish-American War, as well as the Philippine-American War and the First World War. Leahy had formerly served as governor of Puerto Rico from 1939 through 1940, establishing military bases and initiating various public works projects on the island. He had also served as an ambassador to France shortly after that nation had come under German occupation in 1941, where his job, as Leahy himself put it, was to keep the French on our side in so far as possible. He was recalled to the United States in May of 1942 
and two months later, he was the highest ranking member of the United States military, taking orders only from the president. In effect, he was the first chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. His knowledge of foreign policy was of great use to Admiral Leahy, who became the first naval officer to ever hold a five-star rank and was a conduit for all major military decisions of World War II. When the atomic bomb was first developed, Leahy strongly opposed its use on the enemy. Once it had been tested, President Truman faced the decision as to whether to use it. He did not like the idea, but he was persuaded that it would shorten the war against Japan and save American lives. It is my opinion that the use of this barbarous weapon at Hiroshima and Nagasaki was of no material assistance in our war against Japan. The Japanese were already defeated and ready to surrender because of the effective sea blockade and the successful bombing with conventional weapons. My own feeling was that in being the first to use it, we had adopted an ethical standard common to the barbarians of the Dark Ages. I was not taught to make wars in that fashion and that wars cannot be won by destroying women and children. Six months after the attack on Pearl Harbor, the United States Navy entered into three days of fighting that would prove pivotal in the Pacific theater of operations. Thanks to American code breakers, the Navy learned the date and location of a planned Imperial Japanese Navy attack on Midway Atoll located at the northwestern end of Hawaii. Admiral Nimitz mobilized every available aircraft carrier and a total of 41 planes, including Grumman TBF-1 Avengers. The force was enough to surprise the complacent Japanese attackers. The battle at Midway saw four Japanese aircraft carriers sunk, as well as a heavy cruiser. The United States Navy lost one carrier and one destroyer, along with 307 soldiers and sailors. The Japanese lost almost 10 times that number. This decisively defeated the Japanese and served as a tipping point in the favor of U.S. forces in the Pacific. There are no great men, just great challenges which ordinary men out of necessity, are forced by circumstances to meet. A 1904 graduate of the Naval Academy, William Bull Halsey, became one of the few officers to ever be promoted to lieutenant directly from Ensign, skipping over the lieutenant junior grade rank entirely. In 1909, Halsey began his career on the USS DuPont, a torpedo boat. Torpedoes and torpedo boats would become a specialty of his, and from 1912 through 1913, he commanded the first group of the Atlantic Fleet's torpedo flotilla. As the Navy evolved, so did Halsey. He began to see the aircraft carrier as a crucial offensive weapon system, rather as a mere defense mechanism to which some would relegate the vessels. If anything gets in my way, we'll shoot first and argue afterwards. Halsey was not hesitant to strike, and strike hard. His flagship, the USS Enterprise, was at sea, returning to his home base, Pearl Harbor, when it was attacked on December 7, 1941. Later, his carrier took part in raids on Japanese-controlled islands, as well as the Doolittle Raid, which dropped bombs on Japan's mainland in direct response to the Pearl Harbor attack. Illness kept Halsey from commanding his ship at the Battle of Midway, but in October of 1942, Halsey returned to command his ship for the actions at Guadalcanal, where Navy, Air Force, and Marine personnel were able to sink a total of two Japanese battleships, three destroyers, 11 transports, and downed 64 aircraft, effectively blocking supply routes from Japan that were key in taking the Solomon Islands. Nauru Island. Commander. Native nose position. 
He can pilot. Eleven alive. Need small boat. Kennedy. That message was carved on a coconut and was to be the savior of 11 men in the Pacific theater of World War II. On August 2nd, 1943, between Arundel and Kalambangara in the Solomon Islands, the Japanese destroyer ship Amagiri, moving swiftly in the night to avoid United States detection, ran down the motor torpedo boat PT-109. It is unknown whether the destroyer meant this course of action or if they simply did not see the United States Navy vessel in the dark waters. In any event, the crew of PT-109 had only 10 seconds to respond to the impending enemy vessel. 109, as well as PT-162 and PT-169 were patrolling the area in search of enemy ships when the Amagiri surprised them. After the boat struck PT-109, cutting it in half, PT-169 fired upon the Amagiri, missing it. Assuming the crew of PT-109 lost, 169 and 162 returned to base. In fact, only two crew members aboard PT-109 were killed. The rest were led to the safety of a nearby island by their commander, a Harvard Varsity swim team alumnus, Lieutenant Junior Grade John F. Kennedy. The crew placed their shoes and non-swimmers on a timber used as a gun mount and kicked their feet for four hours, landing three and a half miles away on the deserted Plum Pudding Island, one of the few islands in the area not home to a Japanese installation. When the island was found to be without food or drinkable water, Kennedy then swam another two miles to find a habitable island. After relocating to a nearby island with fresh water and coconuts for food, the men were discovered by two natives who had been dispatched by an Australian coast watcher. Kennedy then carved his message on a coconut shell and sent the natives to the nearest U.S. Navy base at Rendova, and the PT-157 rescued Kennedy's beleaguered crew. I can imagine no more rewarding a career and any man who may be asked in this century what he did to make his life worthwhile, I think, can respond with a good deal of pride and satisfaction. I served in the United States Navy. Like many Americans, the attack on Pearl Harbor inspired George Herbert Walker Bush to enlist in the United States military. He became a naval aviator at 18 as part of the U.S. Navy Reserve, at the time the youngest aviator in Navy history. As a part of the torpedo squadron VT-51, his lanky physique earned him the nickname Skin and his unit was victorious in one of the largest air battles of the war, the Battle of the Philippine Sea. On August 1st, 1944, Bush was promoted to lieutenant, junior grade, and was stationed on the carrier USS San Jacinto. As his squadron commenced attacks on Japanese installations on Chichijima in the Bonin Islands, Bush's Grumman TBM Avenger aircraft was shot. And even though one of the engines caught fire, Bush and his crew completed the mission, releasing bombs over their targets. Bush was forced to bail out of the Avenger, and the other three crew members were lost. He survived in an inflatable raft for four hours, with Japanese fighters flying overhead until his rescue by the USS Finback. This mission earned him the Distinguished Flying Cross. For heroism and an extraordinary achievement in aerial flight as pilot of a torpedo plane in Torpedo Squadron 51 attached to the USS San Jacinto in action against enemy Japanese forces in the vicinity of the Bonin Islands on September 2nd, 1944 leading one section of a four-plane division in a strike against a radio station, Lieutenant 
junior grade Bush, pressed home in an attack in the face of intense anti-aircraft fire. Although his plane was hit and set afire at the beginning of his dive, he continued his plunge toward the target and succeeded in scoring damaging bomb hits before bailing out of the craft. His courage and devotion to duty were in keeping with the highest traditions of the United States Naval Reserve. To the superb officers and men on land, on sea, in the air, and undersea who have performed such magnificent feats for our country in the past few days. You have written your names in golden letters on the pages of history and won the undying gratitude of your countrymen. My pride in you is beyond expression. No honor for you could be too great. Magnificently done. God bless each and every one of you. To the glorious Dead Hail heroes, rest with God. During World War I, the United States Navy became the first branch of the American military to allow women to enlist in a non-nursing capacity. Yeomen, or yeomanettes, served largely in clerical capacities. However, many enlisted women went on to become radio operators, electricians, draftsmen, pharmacists, photographers, telegraphers, fingerprint experts, chemists, torpedo assemblers, and camouflage designers. World War II also saw a need for expanded personnel, this time recruiting women into a special auxiliary, women appointed for voluntary emergency service, or WAVES, serving on the continental United States and Hawaii. After both World War I and II, U.S. Navy enlisted women were either discharged or, less commonly, held in reserve status. However, with the passage of the Women's Armed Services Integration Act of 1948, women were made a permanent part of the United States Armed Forces. Reservist and inactive duty women were called back into duty, along with the men, for service in Korea in 1950. Today, women can enlist and apply for any job in the Navy, except for Navy SEAL units. And in 2012, the first women sailors began serving on ballistic and cruise missile nuclear submarines. Today, the United States Navy employs a wide range of the most technologically advanced ships on the water. Aircraft carriers, and amphibious assault ships and transport docks place most nations within striking distance of U.S. air and marine forces, and as such, are essential in forward deployment and deterrence strategies. Cruisers, destroyers, and combat ships are equipped with guided missiles and anti-air and anti-submarine missiles, while frigates, patrol ships, and mine countermeasure ships provide protection for both Navy and merchant ships moving through hostile waters. Modern aircraft carriers and submarines are powered by nuclear reactors. All of the U.S. Navy's battleships and submarines in operation today are nuclear powered. The submarines in the Los Angeles, Seawolf, and Virginia class are attack submarines used in specific tactical missions, including war or defense. The Ohio class, however, act as ballistic submarines with the sole purpose of nuclear deterrence. Ballistic subs are capable of serving as a hidden launching platform for intercontinental ballistic missiles. The end of World War II saw the scrapping and mothballing of many of the United States Navy ships, and by 1948, there remained just over 250 vessels in service. This large-scale decommissioning of ships ended with the rising tensions between the United States and the Soviet Union. While the Korean War brought these tensions to a head, the U.S. Navy did not often have direct involvement in the conflicts that took place. Instead, 
the Navy assisted with large-scale landings at Incheon, where Navy and Marine Corps amphibious forces succeeded in driving back North Korean forces, and at the Battle of Chosen Reservoir, where the evacuation of over 100,000 UN troops required U.S. Navy assistance. Korea made it clear to the United States government that our Navy would have to be ever ready to react to threats, especially during the Cold War, where all eyes were on the Soviets. The United States Navy needed to be ready to respond in the event of aggressive communist threats. Fleets of ships were assigned to every corner of the globe, and as the ships were dispatched, Navy scientists and technicians developed new technologies in communications and defense, as well as new missiles and jet-propelled aircraft. Under the guidance of Admiral Hyman Rickover, the Navy received its first nuclear-powered aircraft carrier, the USS Enterprise. Rickover was a longtime proponent of the Nuclear Marine Propulsion Program. However, he regarded nuclear power and the atomic bomb as necessary evils. On May 5, 1961, a Redstone rocket launched the first American to travel in space, Alan Shepard. Shepard was a graduate of the United States Naval Academy and the U.S. Naval Test Pilot School. He had served on the destroyer USS Cogswell in the Pacific during World War II and was one of 110 test pilots selected to volunteer as part of the famous Mercury 7, NASA's first U.S. manned space program. He was the only member of that initial class of astronauts who would walk on the moon when he commanded the Apollo 14 mission in 1971. Astronaut Jim Lovell was another graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy and was selected as part of the initial group of volunteers. Medical reasons kept Lovell out of the Mercury program, but he was selected in 1962 as part of NASA Astronaut Group 2. Lovell went on to serve in both the Gemini and Apollo programs. He piloted the Gemini 7 and 12, the latter mission flown with Buzz Aldrin. He became one of the first men to travel to the moon on Apollo 9, completing 10 orbits on Christmas Eve, 1968, before returning to the Earth safely three days later. Lovell is perhaps best known as the commander of the Apollo 13 mission. When the Odyssey command module that carried Lovell and pilots Jack Swigert and Fred Hayes became crippled due to an oxygen tank explosion, Lovell's leadership brought the crew back to Earth safely after using the lunar module as a kind of lifeboat and manually adjusting the craft's trajectory, only using his wristwatch for timing. The mission had intended to land on the moon. However, in the resulting survival mission, the crew of the Apollo 13 became the record holders for farthest distance ever traveled from the planet Earth. To halt this offensive buildup, a strict quarantine on all offensive military equipment under shipment to Cuba is being initiated. All ships of any kind bound for Cuba, from whatever nation or port, will, if found to contain cargoes of offensive weapons, be turned back. This quarantine will be extended, if needed, to other types of cargo and carriers. We are not at this time, however, denying the necessities of life, as the Soviets attempted to do in their Berlin blockade of 1948. It shall be the policy of this nation to regard any nuclear missile launched from Cuba against any nation in the Western Hemisphere as an attack by the Soviet Union on the United States, requiring a full retaliatory response upon the Soviet Union. After two unsuccessful CIA-led attempts to quash communist leadership in Cuba, Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev and Cuban leader Fidel Castro agreed that Soviet nuclear missiles based on the island nation 
would prevent any future U.S. invasion attempts. When, on October 14, 1962, a United States U-2 aircraft returned with photographs showing definite evidence of sites for medium-range and intermediate-range ballistic nuclear missiles, what came to be known as the Cuban Missile Crisis was underway. Immediately, President Kennedy and the Joint Chiefs, as well as other top military advisors, began to plan for and stop what could have been the kickoff of all-out nuclear war. Without a formal declaration of war on Cuba, international law and convention would prohibit a naval blockade against the island. A system of quarantine was initiated, whereby U.S. Navy aircraft carriers, destroyers, and other vessels would not permit any transit of munitions or ordnance of any type to enter the country. Merchant ships and food and supply ships were allowed to pass after inspection. With the quarantine came the demand from the United States, remove and disassemble the missile bases on Cuba and send all offensive weapons back to the Soviet Union. Kennedy expected military retaliation from the Soviets, but 13 days later, the Soviet Union and Kennedy's cabinet reached an agreement, sending all of the Cuban missiles back to the USSR in exchange for the United States nuclear disarmament in Italy and Turkey. The crisis was perhaps the most tense moment of the Cold War and the closest we might have come to World War III. It is one thing for politicians here at home, safe in the security of their political offices, to vote to send young American draftees to die in an unconscionable war in Vietnam. But it is another thing to be one of those boys. I do not intend to put their blood on my hands. Vietnam was almost never a popular war. Its very beginnings sparked controversy, and continued American involvement in the conflict led to one of the lowest points for the United States Armed Forces. On August 2nd, 1964, the United States destroyer USS Maddox was conducting a secret intelligence mission in the Gulf of Tonkin off the coast of North Vietnam when it came under attack from three North Vietnamese Navy P-4 torpedo boats 28 miles away from the North Vietnamese coast in international waters. The Maddox suffered minor damage from only a 14 5 millimeter machine gun bullet. Also adding to the contention was an alleged second attack two days later on the Maddox and the USS Turner Joy, which has since been chalked up to a radar glitch and overzealous communications officers making incorrect reports. Nonetheless, President Johnson used the evidence presented to petition Congress to pass the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, giving Johnson authority to use conventional military force in any Southeast Asian country that displayed signs of communist aggression or expansion. That I shall immediately request the Congress to pass a resolution making it clear that our government is united in its determination to take all necessary measures in support of freedom and in defense of peace in Southeast Asia. For the first time since the American Civil War, U.S. Navy forces found themselves engaged in operations on rivers and other tributaries in Vietnam. The river patrols, or Brown Water Navy, consisted of river patrol boats, or patrol air cushion vehicles, also known as hovercraft, that would patrol areas unable to be reached by their larger mothership. Also at play on the rivers, was the patrol craft, also known as swift boats. The swift boats were largely responsible for intercepting movements of Viet Cong munitions and arms, as well as transportation of Vietnamese allies and SEAL teams there to quash insurgencies. Working in cooperation with the Navy was the United States Coast Guard, 
which operated 26-point class cutters on the rivers as well. As U.S. forces were scaled back, these vessels were all donated to the South Vietnamese Navy as part of the United States effort to hand the reins of the war over to the Vietnamese people. In the same speech that John F. Kennedy promised a man on the moon, he also outlined a proposal to form what would eventually become the United States Navy SEALs program. The allocated funds, over $100 million, went into developing the Navy Sea, Air, and Land Team, or Navy SEALs. The force traces its beginning back to the closing years of World War II, when the U.S. Navy Scouts and Raiders School was founded. The teams were utilized in secret anti-communist operations in Cuba, and by 1962, the Navy SEALs were at work in Vietnam. The men with green faces, as the Viet Cong called them, because of their camouflage face paint, became a force to be reckoned with, extremely effective in anti-guerrilla and guerrilla operations, and taking from the Viet Cong what was previously safe territory for the enemy. The Navy SEALs still operate today under extreme secrecy and on more dangerous missions than ever. On May 2nd, 2011, SEAL Team 6 successfully completed its mission to kill Osama bin Laden, the terrorist leader and head of Al-Qaeda responsible for planning the attacks on the United States of September 11th, 2001, after a decade-long manhunt as part of the war on terror. Since the Vietnam War and the fall of the USSR, the United States Navy has continued to develop newer, faster, and more efficient warships and weapons. The US Navy, in response to the lessened threat of nuclear strike, began to position its fleets in order to better serve special operations and strike missions in regional conflict, rather than preparing them for full-scale nuclear war with the Soviets. Today, the Navy is an integral part of the War on Terror, participating in actions during operations Iraqi Freedom and Enduring Freedom, and in Operation Odyssey Dawn in 2011, launching cruise missiles into military targets in Libya in order to enforce UN resolutions and rid the country of its oppressive regime. Our action in the Gulf is about fighting aggression and preserving the sovereignty of nations. It is about keeping our word, our solemn word of honor, and standing by old friends. It is about our own national security interests and ensuring the peace and stability of the entire world. Just after 10 a.m. on the morning of May 17, 1987, an Iraqi Mirage F-1 fighter jet descended on the USS Stark sailing off the coast of Saudi Arabia near the exclusion boundary of the Iran-Iraq war. The jet fired two 1,500-pound Exocet missiles upon the frigate, killing 29 in the explosion and resulting fire, and eight more after the incident from Burns. It remains unclear as to whether the pilot of the Mirage was acting under orders, or if it truly was, as Saddam Hussein later called it, an unintentional accident. However, the attack remains the only successful anti-ship missile strike on any American warship. Operation Desert Storm in 1991 saw hundreds of Tomahawk II cruise missiles launched from naval warships in the Persian Gulf and the battleships USS Missouri and USS Wisconsin firing their 16-inch guns for the first time since the Korean War. Targets in Kuwait were struck, meant to drive out invading Iraqi forces, and the unending barrage from U.S. Navy weapons defeated and sent back the Iraqi army after only 100 hours. Prior to these bombings, Operation Desert Shield saw more than 240 ships carrying 18.3 billion pounds of supplies and equipment into Saudi Arabia to sustain the U.S. and Allied troops in the impending campaigns. The United States Navy's superiority on the seas 
also helped enforce United Nations trade sanctions against Iraq, crippling leader Saddam Hussein's economic lifeline. When a crisis confronts the nation, the first question often asked by policymakers is, what naval forces are available and how fast can they be on station? The terrorist organization Al-Qaeda has long professed to be an enemy of the United States. Before the attacks of September 11th, 2001, there were the U.S. Embassy bombings of 1998 and the suicide attack on the USS Cole in 2000. The U.S. Navy guided missile destroyer was docked in Aden Harbor, Yemen, when a small boat sidled up to the destroyer's port side and exploded. The concussion created a 40 by 40 foot hole in the side of the ship, killing 17 and injuring another 39. Rules of engagement kept the crew from firing upon the small boat, which approached without answering radio calls or requesting permission. In fact, Petty Officer John Washak was ready to fire upon another suspicious craft nearby when he was told by a senior chief petty officer, no shooting unless we're shot at. In the wake of the USS Cole attack and the ongoing war on terror, the US Navy has begun to reevaluate the rules of engagement. 11 carriers, 22 cruisers, 61 destroyers, 26 frigates, two combat ships, 53 submarines, 122 surface warships. There are currently 10 fleets or commands controlled by the United States Navy today, with a wide range of specializations and strategic positions across the globe. The Naval Reserve Force is represented in each of the United States and Puerto Rico and Guam by at least one Navy operational support center where the selective reservist sailors perform their monthly drills. The United States Navy today maintains facilities in North America, Europe, Asia, the Mediterranean, and the Pacific Rim. The largest base overseas is located in Yokosuka, Japan. In 2007, the United States reached its smallest fleet size since World War I with 274 active ships. The small number, however, is more than made up for in the amount of firepower and the sheer size of some vessels compared to earlier ships. The technological advances propelled by the Navy have ensured that our sailors are an unparalleled nautical force. The men and women who serve in the United States Navy help in preserving peace every single day in many corners of the globe. Unofficial mottos for the Navy include honor, courage, commitment, and not for self, but for country. They are our first line of defense on either of our coasts and first responders to remote regional crises. The battle fleet tonnage of our Navy's ships is larger than the next 13 largest navies combined. While in the past, the Navy's fate seemed uncertain, there should remain no question that the United States Navy is an entirely integral, and some might say, the most important part of the United States Armed Forces. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs. And of course, be sure to subscribe to help keep history happening.